Well, thank you for joining us in today's conversation with Dr. Tim Soss, uh, whose main scientific interest is to understand viruses, how they work, and how they take over cells. Dr. Saw is currently a postdoctoral researcher in the lab of Dr. Jens Bosse at the Center for Structural Systems Biology and Hanover Medical School in Germany, where he uses protein structure modeling and correlative imaging to identify viral protein interactions with biological activity. Tim obtained his Bachelor in Science degree from McMaster University in Canada, followed by a PhD in virology from Harvard University, where he studied the assembly of vesicular stomatitis virus with fluorescent microscopy. Then he did a postdoctoral training at the University of Cambridge, studying virus host interactions of herpes, herpes simple, simplex virus one. Today, we will be discussing his recent PLOS one lab protocol article and associated protocol in protocols.io, a validated protocol to UV inactivate SARS-CoV-2 and herpes virus infected cell. Tim, thank you so much for being with us. Yeah, thank you for having me. So if just to kick off, if you can briefly explain what the protocol is about, how to use it, and why it is relevant. Yeah, gladly. Um, so the protocol is about how to inactivate material from a high biocontainment facility. So in the case of viruses, certain ones require a higher biosecurity than the average BSL-2. Um, but not all machines can be used inside the facilities for space constraints or maintenance reasons. And so in order to use these machines to analyze your sample of interest, it has to be inactivated in a way that you can be sure it's no longer infectious. Um, and so this is really the main reason why we need to develop this new protocol, because in order to use certain types of machines, uh, we, had to, we had to inactivate them in a certain way that was compatible with what we were looking for. And to understand the relevance of the protocol, can you help us understand what was the state of the art at the moment? In other words, was there anything published uh, similarly to inactivate viruses using UV? And if so, why those protocols didn't work for you? Um, so I guess a lot of these inactivation protocols are deemed very specific to the particular pathogen they're being used on. So while there have been UV inactivation protocols before, they usually are targeted at uh, different um, families of viruses or to bacteria, and therefore they're not necessarily valid for the particular virus that we were looking at. So in our case, herpes um, or SARS-CoV-2. Um, likewise, there are other inactivation protocols for SARS-CoV-2, um, but because the downstream uses of those particular protocols um, didn't have the same requirements as us, so they often had much harsher conditions using urea or SDS that would completely dissolve um, protein structures. Um, so for our, our case, we were specifically looking for um, what kind of higher order complexes could be formed, and we were trying to isolate them out of these cells in a way that still maintained this quaternary structure. And if we used kind of these more um, common protocols for uh, the types of um, aspect they're used for, um, we're likely to dissolve the complexes we are looking for. Um, so in our case, we wanted to use a different type of inactivation method, UV, and so we had to validate specifically UV on the viruses we were looking at, and then we would be able to take them out of the facility for downstream analysis. Okay, and so you spend all this time, you know, optimizing the protocol, but then you went a step further and decided to, first of all, put it on the platform and make it public, and then get it peer reviewed and published as a standalone, you know, index publication. So I wonder what were your motivations to do both, you know, to, to share it openly in the platform and had then have it peer reviewed. Um, I guess for our institutes, we have to get it for every inactivation protocol, it must be approved by our institute and through the public authorities. Um, and they have a very specific requirements on uh, what criteria must be met in order for, for the protocol to be uh, accepted. By, um, by the two different institutes, um, by the institutes and the authorities, and therefore, and for use. Um, so it's quite a laborious process, and we thought that if uh, we'll go through the process of actually doing all the validation, and there's something that might be useful to other facilities, because therefore, if they can see that it's been published and validated by someone else, other people can probably just go ahead and use it because the data has already been made. Um, 
putting it into somewhere like uh, PLOS protocols where it's peer reviewed and open access, um, I think kind of feeds into the idea of the science where you know, we're creating something that we want other people to use. And by being somewhere that's open access, um, it just makes, it just facilitates this process more. And can you tell us uh, whether and how the feedback that you received from the peer reviewers in PLOS One help shaping the final version of the protocol? Um, yeah, so reviewer comments are always usually quite interesting and in, like the different perspective they give you. Um, so guess a lot of the comments had come back of the precise precision of the language. Um, so I guess it's always interesting that when you uh, lay out a protocol in the way that, you know, think these are all the important uh, points, often someone else from an outside perspective will, will, will not make all the same assumptions you do. So I guess it was useful to be able to like really like, make everything very explicit about what needs to be done and what is really important. Um, I guess in our case for our reviews, there was also a comment about um, DNA nucleic acid repair mechanisms and how this could be different for RNA or DNA viruses since in a cell, which is genomic, um, where the genome is DNA, um, cells have these repair mechanisms. Um, so it's an interesting thing that we could read into um, and then we included in our discussion section uh, in the final version. And now delving a little bit more on the details of the protocol itself, what are the most critical steps where users are likely to make a, a, a mistake? Um, I guess the key parts of this protocol is that it's a consistency and making sure that everything matches how it was tested and that it is done the same every time. Um, so I guess the most critical step in, I guess, an optimization protocol was the mixing. Um, I guess originally we thought, well, if you just UV your sample, you give it a certain UV dose and it shouldn't activate. Um, but one of the problems we were having is that if you just put the UV on for you know, longer and longer, it actually kind of plateaued in the amount of inactivation and there was always a certain residual amount. Um, and so what we, what we realized is that you, have to actually, you actually have to pipette it in between the steps. Um, so mm -hmm. I think this is something about being able to mix it that you know, the top is being inactivated but the bottom wasn't because the cells are so opaque. Um, so that was like a really critical step where you have to mix it um, before, or before between the doses. And then obviously the doses must be the same. So your machine needs to be, I guess, properly calibrated, make sure it's measuring the dose, um, that makes it a fixed distance. Um, and I guess all these types of criteria to making sure that the machine is working as, uh, as it says. That's very interesting. And while developing the protocol, was there anything that you tried but didn't work? And then you have to change to do something else? Um, I guess as with everything in science, um, only a small fraction of the experiments end up being put into the final publication. Um, I guess since this was like very much an optimization protocol, I guess there were other things we tried like, okay, is this, an, is this enough to inactivate? Not quite, so let's add a bit more to the protocol or change a few things. Um, so they end up being a lot more of, um, technical issues rather than any sort of conceptual problems. I see. And, you know, as an early career scientist, um, what do you think has been the impact of having this peer-reviewed article uh, for your career? Uh, I guess that'll be remain to be seen. Um, I guess there's one aspect of how many people actually find this useful, how many people will, I guess, cite this and find that it was useful to them, that they could use this and could take this in activation protocol and then use their material for downstream applications. Um, I guess that's one part that's always rewarding to see like people in the community actually use or or find value in the information that you've learned. Um, I guess on the other aspect of like, what will it help me for directly? Um, I guess this will remain to be seen as we continue to work on this project to see what kind of information we can gain out of this material. And just to wrap up, is there anything that you would like to discuss that we haven't touched? Um, no, I think you've covered all the important aspects of it. Um, well, Tim, thank you so much for uh, sparing some time to talk to us. And it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much.